Hello and welcome to another episode in the History of the Blood War series. I am your presenter, Jayon Wooka, and in the time we have, I'm going to give you an overview of the demon side of the Blood War. In the two-part series on the Military of the Devils, I broke down details from the sources to reveal a relatively complex structure. The demons will only need one video for a thorough look since they don't have any rigid structure, but there are still a number of crucial realizations to take in regarding them. This goes double if you have to face a great demonic host anytime soon. So settle in and I'll tell you everything you need to know about the armies of the abyss. The best place to start this description of the demon forces is an explanation of their method of war. To me, and the sources do support this interpretation, demons are radically different from devils in almost every way. Demons do not respect laws or rights, they only respect power. When they invade, they don't do so with a plan. Demons attack in a confused and furious mass, a single burst of violent energy. Once that mass breaks through its obstacles, however, it begins to fall apart. Most demons are more interested in despoiling a defeated enemy than in returning to get new orders. Then there are the scavengers who follow along in the wake of the first push, hoping to scrape up leavings without doing much work. I believe this is what we should imagine when we think of a place that has fallen to demonkind. Not a land ruled over by a demon as monarch, but a land where demons roam without hiding, visiting their destruction on anything and everything. The only thing that reliably pushes a demon into following orders is the threat of destruction, so only a demon who can destroy all of their followers can ever become the leader of a war party, also known as a war band. Individual parties rarely have more than 1,000 members. The massive demonic armies of legend are actually coalitions of these parties. I'll be referring to these coalitions as hosts or hordes. Sometimes, what we think of as one army is actually several of these hosts who merely happen to be attacking the same target at the same moment. All war parties in a host are considered equal, in theory, regardless of party size or type. Weaker parties might be bullied by stronger ones, but no rule or custom makes them follow any orders. Each host is led by a prince who is elected from and by all the war party leaders. The prince still has no binding or legal authority like a devil general would. Princes are elected due to their power and cunning, as only those qualities make one fit to be chosen as leader. War parties are usually composed entirely of demons which are of the same type, excluding the party leader, who is generally of a more powerful type, in order to manage the others. For example, a war party might be made up of 300 rudderkin, but their leader would probably be a Hezro. Princes of hosts seek to recruit parties of types that could be beneficial to the host's attack. Now, this is the extent of demonic battle planning in almost all cases, but that does not mean that it's not a serious matter. Promises of a specific share in the spoils, or of special prey that a party can expect to devour, and direct flesh bribes are a prince's main tools in luring potential allies, which spurs princes to keep conquering more in order to meet these demands. Though I said that demons don't respect law or by right assertions, they do still feel fear, and this is the main way that both party heads and host princes keep their underlings in line. Beyond any leader's personal might, Assassins and torturers are often used to silence rivals within their group, while special detachments drag deserters back to their parties. This is key for a leader not only to maintain their forces, but also to secure their control. Each time a leader is opposed, it lessens their stature in the eyes of others. Reputation is the mirror of identity, and when the mirror is downcast, it creates a true reduction of their power. When a demon's power is reduced, they are less able to impose their will on their followers. In short, every desertion makes the next one that much easier. With that said, some desertion is to be expected and many low-level demons are able to slip through the cracks. There are always some stragglers left behind after a battle. When analyzing the demonic forces from the outside, it can be useful to categorize their parties, so I'll do that here. Individual war parties are mostly defined by their leaders. 
A rough way to rank these parties is by size. A party of 10 or less is led by a boss. Parties of less than 100 are led by chieftains, and a party of less than 1000 is under a chief. These numbers should be thought of as soft maximums, not strict ones. The leader of 150 or 200 followers might still be known as a chieftain, but at 500 one is likely considered a chief. The most powerful chiefs, outside of lords, who I'll get to later, are likely to top out at 3000 minions in their party, and this would only be for short periods accompanied by heavy conscription. Even these great chiefs will have parties of around 1000 during normal times. Beyond these numbers is the domain of hosts. Demons themselves are unlikely to reference this boss chieftain chief system, but the respect and fear that any leader is given absolutely does depend on the composition of their war party, not only its size but also the type of demons they lead. Within a host, the party leaders collectively make up an informal council which we'll call the chief circle. Each leader, whether boss, chieftain, or chief, is supposed to have an equal voice in the circle, but obviously those with more actual power tend to steer decisions. Though many demons are brought into a war effort through fear of their leaders, the leaders themselves are primarily driven by the opportunity to destroy and consume. This is why, even though demons are awed by power first and foremost, less powerful but more cunning demons are sometimes chosen as prince of their host. Remember, even though they are chaotic, demons are not stupid and, while they may be short-sighted or impatient, they are still able to see opportunities and work towards those opportunities. Like I said before, party leaders usually command demons who are of a different, lesser type. The most common leader is the Hezro, followed in numbers by the more powerful Merilith, then the Molydeus, and most rarely, the Balor. There are only two types of regular Blood War demons who are usually led by one of their own type. Vrox, because their natural flight means that they don't have many other peers, and Bar Ulgura because they despise all non-Bar Ulgura. Follower types serve one of three main roles for a host in battle. There are the skirmishers, mainly Jovox and Werderkin, the flying attack demons, which are Vrox and Zavutz, and the main attack demons, including the Bulizaus, Bar Ulgura, and Zavutz. Dretches and mains are not counted as part of war parties but are still important to the war effort. They are gathered up by main attack parties and driven ahead of them in battle, softening the enemy up before the real fighting force can smash in. Some types of demons such as Goristros and Succubi would serve specific roles rather than making up entire parties on their own. I plan to go into each species in their own video so I'll expand more in time. There is one type that I wanted to mention specifically though, the Armanite. This demon appears well suited to the Blood War. Perhaps too well suited. This is a slight departure from the material, but to me, what makes the demons interestingly different from the Devils is that, aside from the Succubi, no demonic type feels built for any one purpose. The idea of a demon that is so obviously geared towards mass warfare and nothing else just doesn't really interest me. I wanted to mention this because they are so perfect for the Blood War and people might expect me to include them. I don't actually plan to do any material on Armanites at all. However, if you believe they do fit for your adventures, keep watching until the end as I think you'll be able to slot them into the host pretty easily when you have the whole context. Now, it is not unheard of for party leaders to be overthrown and destroyed by a sudden revolt in their ranks. A chief's own power is usually enough to suppress challenges, but their authority grows weaker as they conscript more demons to their cause. Remember, a demon's authority is based on the idea that they can destroy all the members of their party if they needed to. So the more they need to destroy, the more difficult that task will be, and the less their authority will be. One way that leaders can protect their authority is by accepting special followers known as parasites of power, though the relationship is mutually beneficial. These parasites provide different services to the leader, such as companionship or magical knowledge, and in return, the leader protects and rewards them more than the other members of their party. 
Parasites are bound to the leader through some means that's more direct than mere threats, such as a magical blood oath. This protects the leader against any simple treachery from the parasites. Such efforts aren't really practical for the entire party, but they are worth it for valuable assistance. Possible roles for such parasites are the consort or intimate companion, the keeper who is the seneschal or butler responsible for keeping the leader's quarters and providing consumables, the drudge also known as a cupbearer who is one who serves consumables and is a favored general lackey, the magicker who is the leader's magic worker and alchemist, the war boss who is the second in command of the war party and sometimes is the main driver of the party in battle, and the death guard who serves as both bodyguard and champion. Most leaders do not have parasites, and even those who do often don't have all or even most of the roles occupied. The most commonly occupied would probably be consort, so chieftains would probably be of a level to have a consort if they wanted to, but perhaps not any of the others, just for an example. So this makes parasites, all of these uh, elements that I've just mentioned make parasites, not only an effective way to hold on to power, it makes parasites symbols of that power as well. One thing that great fiends from either side of the blood war have in common is the use of titles. That is, respected nicknames or appellations like Prince of Demons, Father of Slime, or Angel of the Everlasting Void. Unlike the Archdevils though, who have titles mainly as affectations, the titles of powerful demons are an integral part of demonic culture. All demons strive to carve out a fearsome reputation, which means not only staking out one's own greatness, but also throwing down as many rivals as possible. Titles are a major factor in this endeavor because anyone can claim a title, even if someone else already claims it. However, claiming the title which someone else already claims is a direct and unavoidable challenge. Titles are diminished when more than one person has it. Being the sole holder means all references go to the same point, so having multiple holders means that title's effect is diluted. This means that multiple claimants make a battle for sole ownership inevitable. Titles are most impressive when they suit the holder. The slime lord Dewyblex would probably gain very little from being known as the Prince of the Succubi. In other words, Titles don't give anything to a holder just by holding them. Instead, the holder has to back them up in order to give them effect. The wider a title can be applied, the more reputation it builds, but this obviously invites more challengers. In fact, though titles can be invented by anyone, the act of taking another's title is a display of power appealing enough that anyone with a title, even a largely meaningless title, becomes a target. Because of this, I believe that the quote unquote entry level for creating any title would be princes leading hosts of at least 20,000. Even so, not all such princes would take a title immediately due to the pitfalls I laid out. Titles are primarily for those demons who want to build up serious power bases and create an influence that reaches beyond their own hosts. The most feared title held by a creature of the abyss is the title Prince of Demons currently held by the nightmare beast Demogorgon. It does not make him the ruler of all demon kind, but it does mark him out as the most powerful. At least, it says that he claims to be the most powerful, and that there is no one existing who has successfully challenged him. The title has had two prior known holders. Obox Ob held it first, possibly by reason of being the first demon to possess and be possessed by the Heart of the Abyss. The title was next held by Miska the Wolf Spider as a gift from his lover and superior, the Queen of Chaos, who stole the title from Obox Ob through his murder. As an aside, Queen of Chaos is also supposedly a title, one which has totally overtaken any prior identity she had. Eventually, the Queen of Chaos was defeated by the forces led by the lawful Wind Dukes of Akka, in that battle, Miska was banished to parts unknown by the artifact which became the Rod of Seven Parts. With none present who could defeat him, Demogorgon seized the vacated title of Prince of Demons. 
As a final note, this development shows that at one point the Queen of Chaos was a higher title than that of Prince of Demons, but after the Queen's defeat, her title was diminished in importance. Even so, remember that there was a Prince of Demons in opposition to the Queen, so it's possible that the title Prince of Demons was the highest during Obox Ob's reign as well as the present. Another similarity between devils and demons is that both recognize a class of powerful unique fiends which stand above the rest. For devils, these are the dukes and the lords. For demons, we can call them warlords and overlords. All demon lords are able to exert their will over their surroundings to create environments to match their desires. But while a warlord dominates a stronghold or a country, an overlord controls an entire layer of the abyss. There is no clear division here. For example, though Baphomet is usually acknowledged as overlord of the 600th layer, called the Endless Maze, the powerful Pale Knight also resides there and constantly seeks to expand her influence. I think very few would claim that Pale Knight is definitively weaker than Baphomet, even though she is still categorized by us as a warlord and not an overlord. Still, not even overlords can claim complete control over their domains. The essence of chaos, which is fundamental to the abyss, simply contorts away from any absolute authority. Now that I've introduced the notion of a demon lord, I want to take the time to clarify the terms as I'm using them. In the sources, demon lord and demon prince are used interchangeably. For me, they are related but not exactly the same. Being a demon lord means that one has control over a part of the abyss, while being a demon prince means that one has been elected to lead a host of demons for battle. That said, most demon lords are also demon princes, and the greatest of all princes are in fact the demon lords. As beings of power that far surpasses even that of Valors and Malidei, demon lords are personally able to maintain war parties of 10,000 or more, even so, they only lead such apocalyptic numbers when they are in charge of incredible hosts. What makes even a lord's host so unstable is the erratic nature of demon kind. As said before, the only way to focus demons is immediate terror or the promise of a near reward, but these factors are also the leading reasons for demons to escape or rebel at the first opportunity. For demon leaders to make a sustained attacking push against an enemy, they must go through a constant cycle of driving their hosts into battle, fighting the enemy, then allowing followers to raise and pillage, and then laboriously regathering forces for the next assault. At every step of the way, a significant number of stragglers are simply lost. This inconstancy means that demons are never able to execute a traditional siege and they never even try to. Instead, if a demon host is strong enough, it will immediately try to overwhelm the target stronghold. Goristros are often recruited here as alternatives to siege engines, while Succubi and Glabrizu can tempt the defenders into betraying their fellows. If the demons can't win an assault, the host will likely disperse and the demons will pillage the surrounding area, satisfying their need to destroy while also preventing the defenders from getting support. The defenders will eventually have to sally out, and that draws a crush of demons in to annihilate them. This need to destroy or consume is the driving force for every demon. They view the two acts as one and the same. Demons only seek power as a way to satisfy this desire in greater amounts and with fewer obstacles. They only lead others in order to demolish things that they couldn't destroy on their own, in other words. Their ultimate goal in the Blood War is to destroy everything. Not just the devils, but all beings throughout all the planes. At present, demons are unable to reach past the lower planes en masse, so they are primarily concerned with running over these lower planes. The mightiest demon princes recognize that the devils represent the greatest challenge to a possible demonic devastation of the lower planes, so many princes scheme for ways to overcome the legions of the Nine Hells. Fighting in the Blood War is a good way for those who survive to advance their power, and it provides many opportunities for demons to slay and devour a wide variety of opponents. While devils generally pretend to all be on the same side, keeping their contest to cloak and dagger intrigue, demons war with one another openly. 
Some conflicts between princes are nearly as old as the blood war itself. Few demons have any objections to attacking other demons, and some, such as Bebeliths and Bar Ulgura, do so as a matter of course. Still, if there are non-demonic targets around, demons are much more likely to attack those first. In other words, you probably won't see demons fighting other demons outside of the abyss. To complete this overview, I'm going to lay out an example demon host. To make it simple, let's assume that each individual war party has 500 members, including the party leader. Rather than having a lord's capacity, we'll have the prince for this host be a valor with a personal war party of 1,000. Unlike devils, demons are unlikely to name their hosts, instead just being known by their prince. We'll call this Balar Sample, so this is Sample's host. The host will be made up of roughly 1 8th skirmish troops, 2 8 flying troops, and 5 8 main attack troops. The skirmish troops will be 6 parties of 500 Rudderkin and 4 parties of 500 Jovox. Each party will be led by a Hezro chief. The flying troops will be 16 parties of Vrocks and 4 parties of Zavots, each led by a Vrock chief. The main attack troops of usual size will be 15 parties of Bar Ulgura with one of their own type as chief, 15 parties of Bulazau led by a Hezro chief, and 10 parties of Zavots also led by a Hezro. There are also 10 groups of about 1,000 Dretches and Mains each being driven by a small party of 10 Vrocks with a Hezro boss. Finally, there is the Balor Prince's party of 1,000 Vrocks, which we will count with the main attack troops. Our Balor Prince sample is likely to have a full complement as parasites as well, with the following as possible types. A Succubus as consort, a Nalfeshni as keeper, that is Seneschal, an Incubus as drudge, a Glabrizu as Magicker, a Merilith as Warboss, and a Molydeus as Death Guard. Altogether, Sample the Demon Prince would lead a modest host of about 46,000 demons. The most powerful demon lords are able to gather hosts of more than 1 million, though holding such a great many chaotic hungers in check requires a mighty, ceaseless effort. For the moment, that is all I have for you about the way that demons gather themselves up for the blood war. Where with the devils we focused on structures, with the demons the focus is more on how and why these fundamentally chaotic beings come together in numbers and with purpose that can rival the rigid discipline of their great adversaries. I hope you found this piece enjoyable and useful, especially if you are going to be diving into the blood war for any length of time. For the History of the Blood War series and the Near Zone channel, I am Jay Unwoka and I appreciate you spending your time here with me. Thanks.